When we started to realize that these underlying technologies would actually be really um, potentially have a huge impact on how governance is done within industries and also just not just uh, industries but also in society in general. So I think there's a lot of discussion today around blockchain and everyone talks about it as removing the middleman. Um, you know, and a lot of people, in particular in the UK, do seem to, to think that this means that you're going to get rid of a lot of government agencies or stuff like that. And the one, the one thing that I can say before I go into our case studies is, you know, blockchain is a technology, just like every other generation of technology. We've seen this before. Um, it, it, it will change a lot of things, but you still have people involved, and it's still going to require governance. It just might re require a different set of processes in the governance structure. It's not going to get rid of government or get rid of governance. Um, you know, it just changes the way in which we might manage it. Um, so the, the centre itself, we have um, about six to seven people working in it at the moment. The director is a professor of computer science. We have uh, a very interdisciplinary approach in, precisely because these technologies are so broadly applicable. We have people from medicine, we have people from social science, we have people from economics and business, and people like myself who are split between both economics and technology. Um, and the reason, this is one of the reasons that I find this area so exciting is that actually I think this is the first truly digital economy uh, piece of uh, technology or solution we've actually ever seen. It combines technology with economics in a way that I don't think we've ever seen previously. You can't do technology research in this area without understanding the economics of um, the, the consensus protocol, and you can't actually do good economics research without understanding how the consensus protocol works and what are the incentives behind those mechanisms. Um, so within uh, the centre we have two really broad areas of research. The first one is um, you know, the engineering and computer science aspect, so how do we ensure that the protocols are robust and scalable, um, for example, but also we're starting to look quite a lot at smart contracts and the concept of non-determinism. So if you put a Turing complete uh, computing language into a smart contract, this actually might create a really interesting situation where we have a non-deterministic smart contract, if you will, that is competing with what is effectively a deterministic world. So when you look at the way that a contract is, uh, is established by lawyers, it is, it is deterministic. And it, it has to be that because of you know, the nature of, of people, if you will. Um, so for, for, you know, for that reason, we've started to move away from calling them smart contracts, actually. I mean, they effectively are distributed applications. It's a new way of doing distributed applications and sharing data between them. Um, but I think there's a really fascinating piece of regulatory work that needs to be done there in order to understand what a smart contract really means. So who is legally responsible if somebody writes bad code? And that contract, for example, then sits in Ethereum or another smart contract mechanism, and it never actually executes. And despite the fact the service has been delivered, that the person who's delivered the service doesn't get paid. I mean, who, who, where does that responsibility lie? Uh, and I think there's a, a, you know, there's a parallel to be drawn with autonomous vehicles, whereby you, you know, if an autonomous vehicle crashes into some, someone or a bus or something, Who's actually responsible for it? Is the car manufacturer? Is it the person who owns the car? Is it the person? Is it potentially Google who may have written, you know, I, I don't know, forgotten to put a reference in uh, or a pointer, and it doesn't work very well, so it's crashed. So I mean, these are these are really really challenging areas actually for society right now to understand how they work. Um, the other area that I think probably is quite interesting for a lot of people in the room is that we also look at applications. So where do these, um, you know, where can we try to build proofs of concept and actual working solutions in industry? So we've done quite a few. We've done smart, con smart contracts or distributed <laughs> applications uh, for government, um, where we were looking at how you can use these contracts to reduce the cost and create more transparency and efficiency for local authorities. So we investigated specifically the case of um, waste management. So, um, you know, collecting garbage quite often is subcontracted from the council in the UK, in local authorities, and quite often if a citizen has a problem with the way that the garbage is being maintained or collected, uh, they have to ring the council, make a complaint. 
Um, and that process can take two to three weeks, you know, if there's you know, not enough people to handle the request. So using the blockchain, we built a solution whereby you could, as a citizen, register a complaint or a, you know, even a positive remark if you wanted to. That's immediately transparent to everybody in that ecosystem. So it's transparent to the contractor. It's transparent to other citizens in the area who might want to also say, hey, this has been a problem for a very long time. But it's also transparent to the council. Uh, the idea then is the contractor could automatically come and pick something up, you know, if something's been missed. Uh, and alternatively, if the contract um, uh, is not executed properly over a, you know, a certain period of time, they might not, you know, they'd either get a, a penalty or not get paid. Um, so, you know, it's an interesting trial of, of that kind of smart contract um, idea. The other one that is quite interesting as well is we've been looking at some ID management issues. Um, so blockchain is often referred to as a, a really great mechanism for ID management. I think the United Nations were talking about it even last week or the week before, um, you know, as a method to create universal identity. Uh, we've looked at it from a university perspective. So how do we prove the identity and the um, qualifications of our students? So, for example... Um, we, you know, we're often asked, universities across the UK and actually across the world, or, you know, reference requests come in quite often. Um, and you, you'll find that people lie either about the exact degree that they had or the marks that they got. So by registering all of those things onto the blockchain, um, you can remove a lot of delay in the hiring process. Um, so, for example, I know at some universities in the UK, people were, it was so delayed getting the um, identity check done or the, re the qualification check done that they missed the job because the reference didn't come through in time. <laughs> so if we can remove, you know, it removes cost for the hiring person, uh, so the company who's trying to hire because they don't need to pay the reference check fee. It makes uh, students' lives a lot easier. They don't need to constantly ask the university to get that reference and the university doesn't need to constantly file through what are effectively paper records. Um, so that's quite a neat solution and also it's one of those good examples I think of blockchain which you can run in parallel. So I think what we're going to see is systems running in parallel rather than necessarily you know, completely obliterating the established um, system. Um, you know, and you can still have your paper graduation certificates alongside a blockchain one. Um, we're also looking at the peer-to-peer -peer economy, sharing economy. We've also been looking quite a lot at humanitarian solutions, so how can blockchain be used in humanitarian situations. Um, and another interesting one is looking at the distributed ledgers for cr the protection of critical infrastructure. So as I'm sure everyone's aware, we've got the concept of a smart city, which of, you know requires much the same as a smart contract <laughs> is, a, is a bit of a misnomer, but um, it, it, it uh, requires you know, the embedding of sensors into critical infrastructure across the cities. If we do that, actually, you're allowing critical infrastructure to be exposed to hacking. Um, and one of the good things that you can do with a distributed ledger is register on or hash into the distributed ledger the current firmware of a particular device. Um, so there, uh, there are obviously scalability issues that need to be thought about in order to address that properly, but we've built a, a demo solution whereby you're able to see or get an early warning on when something has been tampered with in the network. So you, you, would be, you don't fix the security problem, but you know that something has changed, so you need to actually, actually change something there. Um, so, I mean, some of the other projects that we're looking at, um, you know, from a purely research and theoretical perspective is um, if we think about digital technologies and in particular this, this idea of the distributed ledger um, becoming a new form of economic structure, a thing that's very important to understand from a regulatory perspective is the power relationships. So what are the power relationships actually in the Bitcoin network? Now, that requires looking at both the monetary flows, but also the actual distribution of nodes in the network. So if, if any of you have been watching the debate going on in the Bitcoin network, a lot of people are saying this is now a Chinese currency because so many of the nodes actually sit in China. Well, is it really? You know, are there, it might, the mining might be sitting there, but are the transactions sitting there? So we're, we're currently look at, uh, looking at some of those power relationships and trying to understand how um, governments can work within those new frameworks. 
Um, and we're also looking quite a lot at the barriers and opportunities, so we're doing some social science research in order to understand what are the real organisational barriers in order to implement these technologies. I think quite obviously one of the big problems with distributed ledgers is the fact that you have to get so many people to agree before you can build the ledger itself. So, I mean, you can also see in the Bitcoin network um, there's arguments about block size. So they can achieve consensus technically, but again, people can't achieve consensus when they're talking to each other. So it's an interesting uh, conundrum there. Um, and then finally, uh, we, we're running a bunch of game theory experiments, obviously, because this is a fascinating place to do incentives. It's a really interesting way, a place to study incentives and how they're working. Uh, and all of these kind of uh, statistical and game theoretical analysis we'll, we'll use to um, improve the protocol. So using, we'll, we'll take the economics learning in order to develop and improve protocols um, in the blockchain area. Um, from a regulation perspective, um, as I said, it's just a technology. And I personally think that every industry will be having to regulate this in a different way because industries have different requirements, different needs. So, you know, financial services will have know your customer, all of these kind of, um, these kind of activities. But in um, supply chain management, it really depends on what you, what's in your supply chain, um, how you'll be regulated. Um, other than that, I really enjoy it, so happy to talk to anyone about it afterwards. <laughs> Thanks.